Often students tell me that history is boring and there's no point in learning it because it has nothing to do with today. You couldn't be more wrong. We can recognize there are problems that can have links to colonization. But the guiding question in this unit is, do we have an obligation to respond to these problems even though we're not directly responsible for those actions? What could be the consequence if we choose to ignore the historical legacy of these problems? And can the response go too far in creating unintended consequences like learned helplessness? The scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference are the foundations for the many terrible atrocities committed in Africa today. For example, in Rwanda, the Belgian colonizers preferred the minority Tutsi people because they were taller and had lighter skin color, so they looked more like Europeans than the majority Hutus did. So the Tutsis got all the privileges, but when the Belgian colonizers were overthrown and democracy was established, that meant that the Hutu majority was now in power and the Tutsi minority didn't like this. In 1994, this led to one of the worst acts of genocide in world history, where almost a million people were killed in just a few months. And all of this because, in part, the Belgians decided that two warring tribes should be forced to live together, and then paternalistically change the relationship between those tribes for generations. Africa is so rich in natural resources, it should be one of the most prosperous regions of the world, but the legacy of corrupt European rulers has contributed to corrupt governments today. Somalia is a failed state. A war in the Congo that ended in 2003 is believed to have led to the death of 5 million people. Sudan recently split into two pieces, but that hasn't stopped the fighting between the Muslim Arab North and the indigenous South. And Sierra Leone had a horrific war in the 1990s, partly financed with blood diamonds that were purchased by people around the world without realizing what they were supporting. Today, the international community does feel a responsibility and is working to try and make things better in Africa. There's many organizations that provide aid, whether it be through the government directly or through NGOs, which are non-government organizations. You probably know them better as charities. There's also support for investments in African countries to help build up their economy, which you'll see in the next unit can be very effective for establishing peaceful relations. There's many peacekeeping efforts on the continent to help keep the peace, and many of those peacekeepers come from the African Union, which is an international organization similar to the European Union. The Middle East has shifted rulers many times, with the most recent being after World War I, when Britain and France took over many of the territories that had previously belonged to the Ottoman Empire that they had defeated in the war. Just like with Africa and North America, France and Britain randomly split up the region without considering ethnicities. So, for example, the Kurdish people, who'd been promised their own country, were split apart into several different countries. Do some research to find out what is the current status of the Kurdish people in the region. Another contemporary issue relating to imperialism is the race relations in the United States. While the U.S. outlawed slavery with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, white citizens didn't like the loss of their power and changed the laws to take any power away from black people again. By the 1960s, people began to participate in the civil rights movement to protest this legal discrimination. That included people like Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. The government responded to these protests by passing the Civil Rights Act in 1964 in order to ensure that all people should be treated equally. But that still hasn't happened. What are some current events that demonstrate the legacy of historical globalization on race relations in the United States? In the spirit of assimilating all indigenous peoples in Canada, many important spiritual ceremonies like the Sundance, Powwow, and Potlatch were banned. Today these ceremonies are being revitalized with support from the government. And we've also talked about the terrible abuse that Aboriginal children experienced in residential schools. The government has since apologized for supporting these schools and has set up various programs in order to help those communities overcome that abuse. Another effort the Canadian government is making is the support for Aboriginal language programs in universities. Because of residential schools, children were punished for speaking their traditional languages and many First Nations dialects were lost. But now we're working to preserve those languages that are left. Now, don't confuse all of these programs with treaty rights. First Nations have treaty rights that are part of the agreement that was created to allow the colonists to settle on the land. They're not an apology for past bad behavior. When you hear about a land claim settlement, it's because the Canadian government did not respect a legal requirement, not because they wanted to apologize for bad behavior. And you've grown up in a Canada that works hard to appease the concerns of Francophone citizens. Remember that because of the migration of more Anglophones, Francophones were upset that they were now being treated like second-class citizens, afraid that they might be assimilated. In the 1960s, the Quiet Revolution encouraged Francophone Canadians to demand more rights. This is why Canada is a bilingual country today, and there's many government programs established to help ensure that Francophone culture in Canada is not eliminated. 
The Métis people were created by the interaction of First Nations people and explorers, many of them French. Métis doesn't just mean someone who thinks they have some native ancestry mixed with other stuff, but a community of people. It's very similar to the Mezzizzo people in the former Spanish colonies. By the time New France was conquered by the British in 1763, the Métis people identified themselves as a distinct people, but by then the importance of the fur trade was declining and they were being discriminated against. The Riel resistance and the creation of Manitoba improved their lot for a time, but then racism would creep its ugly head in again. Today things have changed and the government is working to help them revitalize their culture. It can be frustrating for some Anglophone Canadians to see these minority groups being given special rights, whether it be Francophones, First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. But it's very important to remember how they were treated in the past and why it's important to preserve their cultures to prevent us from all becoming homogenous. And we've talked before about the importance of preserving languages. Very remote regions of the world are finding it difficult to protect their language as their children want to move to larger cities and learn the language of the majority. It's been written that language brings with it an identity and a culture, or at least the perception of it. A shared language says we're the same. A language barrier says we're different. The author goes on to say that the creators of the policies of apartheid in South Africa understood this and used it to keep all of the different African tribes seeing themselves as separate. That way the people would fight each other instead of fighting the white minority that was keeping them down. So, protecting a language can be a double-edged sword, defining differences that can lead to conflict. In Spain, the Basque and Catalonians were denied their ability to speak their language, and once they gained their linguistic freedoms with the fall of the Franco dictatorship, the call to separate from the country seemed to be getting louder and louder. But the great thing is that just as language can be used to promote conflict, it can also be used to promote acceptance of differences. By having various programs to encourage people to hold on to their own identity, we can support greater diversity. All of these actions of the past impact our reputation around the world. So when we want to go into another country and help them with a social or economic problem, they may look at our past and say that we just want to come in and colonize them, leading to their assimilation. And if you really think about it, aren't there times when we think we could run the country better than they can, that ethnocentric attitude? In Social 30, you're going to look at how often going into a country to solve their problems can actually just make more problems. But hold on, it's not all bad. There's times when we want to get involved in the affairs of another country for humanitarian reasons. We genuinely want to help other people without thinking about what we can get out of it. Because of globalization, we can feel a closer connection to people around the world. What is a recent event that's occurred in another part of the world that's concerned many Canadians? Often we'll watch the news and hear about a terrible tragedy like a natural disaster or a war and do what we can, both personally and through our government, to try and help these people. Our world is also much more tolerant, despite that loud minority that wants to hold on to traditional racist values. Look in your own school. Are there students from other cultures or parts of the world that you can learn from? As a country, we're no longer wanting to assimilate people, but encourage immigrants to Canada to help us create our mosaic of cultural identity. While there are some people who feel it would be better if we all kept to ourselves and stayed in our own country, most Canadians understand that, first of all, the traditional British heritage of Canada comes from one group of people coming from another country and changing it. And secondly, our world is a more peaceful and prosperous place because of globalization. By remembering our history, we can be sure that the negative aspects of historical globalization don't happen again.